Yep, okay, so next up is Martin Clash, who's gonna to talk to us about estimating power noise. Take it away. Yeah, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here and tell you about a project that I did mainly together with uh, Thomas Wagner and also Hermann Kampelmann and Dagmar Bruce. So Thomas was a quantum error correction person and my background is quantum system characterization. Uh, so I also will start with a later topic. So I have some experience there and the main question we ask there is like, suppose I'm given remote access to a quantum device. The first thing I would like to do is to try to figure out how well does the device work. And um, there are lots of protocols, like the most popular ones are probably gate set tomography and randomized benchmarking. Um, like either you're on the, on, the, on the side of having like a high complexity and also gaining a lot of information, but then you can only apply it to small sus subsystems, like with gate set tomography, but then you learn everything there is, say, about a small gate set. Or you can be on the other extreme end here where you have to deal or you get, need to, to get away with a lower complexity, but then you're also able to learn something about the interplay of different components, like with randomized benchmarking or polychannel tomography. And what we, these methods have in common is that they are typically run before you d actually do something with a quantum computer. And, uh, and they are not tailored to any specific application. So, so somehow you need to translate the outcome to whatever you want to do, like when you want to improve the errors in your uh, setup or calibrate your software, this needs to be done separately. And what, what Thomas and I have asked is like what, what can, yeah, in quantum error correction you have measurement data uh, for, for other reasons, but you, you get it. Um, and what can you learn from that data? Is there any system characterization task you can solve with that? <clears throat> So, and that's exactly what I will talk about. Um, so first I will talk about um, quantum error correction and noise estimation on a higher level and in more general. Uh, then I give you a very basic example and then I share with you our own results and let's see how far we get into the proof. <clears throat> um, yeah, as you all know, of course, we need quantum error correction for universal quantum computing and the overhead is huge. Um, we all know the scheme, like we, we, we have some quantum computer and then we make cinder measurements, have a decoder which gives us the correction instructions. Now, when you know what the, what, how the noise on, on your quantum computer, on the physical cu qubits, let's say, is distributed, then you can use that information to calibrate your decoder and get, uh, 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 yeah, get, get a logical, yeah, lo lower logical errors. And in this talk, I will focus on just on stabilizer codes and uh, quantum memory. Uh, so if basically a phenomenological noise level, uh, model uh, just with Pauli errors. Okay, the, these, these restrictions I have to make. And uh, uh, yeah, now, now when we want to get, get an estimate of such a noise model, what you usually do is you, as I said, you characterize the, the device before operation and then you can adapt uh, your decoder correspondingly. So we get this type of diagram. And in this way, like the ultimate goal would also be to calibrate, to be able to calibrate the decoder during operation. That, that's sort of the far term goal. It's not what, what I will achieve today, but we, we are taking, I think, a, a good first step in that direction. And uh, there are several challenges. Um, so first of all, it's, uh, yeah, when you have uh, a given syndrome, there are, of course, different errors that might have caused the syndrome. So it might, yeah, it's a priori unclear on how to estimate the, the error rates of, of, the, of your physical device, let's say. And we're not allowed to touch the encoded information, which is different as in the standard quantum system characterization methods where we can completely destroy the state. And uh, the decoding is computationally hard. So this might hint in the direction that estimating the error rates is also computationally hard, but it isn't, uh, and I, I will explain you why. And before, there, were, uh, there are already a couple of papers that we found out after our first results, um, uh, but they are either heuristic approaches, which focus on the regime of very low error rates, or they are quite restricted by looking only at very specific codes, uh, uh, but then also with some rigorous results. And in... Uh, in our work, we basically lift all these restrictions. We, we can uh, say something about arbitrary uh, uh, stabilizer codes and also more general codes, 
<coughs> about arbitrary error rates and, and, and full Pauli noise, and when uh, instead of just the, the bit flip noise which has been considered here. So to basically explain, like I realized that the second part of my talk is quite technical, um, but what I'm going to say in my second talk is very similar to to a basic example that I can explain just, just on one slide, okay? Uh, which is for the Tori code. So I hope you all know the Tori code. There we have uh, these uh, star-shaped uh, operators where the qubits, they sit on the edges. And uh, here we have the Z stabilizer composed of three Z, uh, Z operators. And what I'm going to assume just for the example is that we have independent errors on each qubit, in independent Pauli errors, okay? Um, just to make life easier for, for the example. And um, now the problem is, like, say, say we observe a syndrome like this. Like we, we get for, from this stabilizer and that stabilizer, we, we get a minus one. Uh, so we know that there is an error. So it might be this type of error, like the two red edges, or it might be this one, or it might be also another, another one. And when you account, when you, when you want to, say, you want to calculate the syndrome probability of obtaining the syndrome, then you need to evaluate an exponentially large sum, which, which looks, looks pretty much intractable. Uh, but it fortunately it isn't. <laughs> um, so let, let's go through the math, okay? Um, what we realized, it was, it's a simple but key observation, is that talking about expectation values of uh, stabilizer measurements makes, makes life much easier than talking about error rates. Uh, um, so when we say we take one of the stabilizers, then we can express the expectation value. We've assumed independent Pauli noise on each qubit. We can express the expectation value as the product of these expectation values here. And let's say now we consider uh, two stabilizer operators, like the, the, the ones indicated in blue on, let's call them S1 and S2, then uh, we can apply to each of them the same formula here. Um, you need to go, don't go, need to read all the equations, but I just want to show you the, the big picture here. Um, and one more thing is that when we have a product of two such stabilizers, we can also do the similar calculation and express this by a ex product of expectation values of these stabilizers. And now the left-hand side of the system of equations is something that we can measure, or which we measure anyway during quantum error correction. And the right-hand side contains information that we want to know. For instance, the error rate of the fourth qubit here uh, in the middle, and we can solve the system of equations for, for exactly that error rate, which is unique up to a sign, and the sign choice just corresponds to, to the symmetry of the code when you flip all the error rates around one half. Uh, but we're interested, of course, in the part where the error rates are way below one half, so, so this isn't an issue here, so we always assume that our error rates are smaller than one half, and then, then that's good, okay? So th this is how, how all the overall scheme works. And let, let's keep this in mind for, for, for the second part of the talk. So now we come out to our new results. Okay, this, this formulation also has been sort of new, but, but uh, here are our main results. And in order to explain our main results, I need to introduce some notation. Um, so I said with, that we focus on Pauli noise. So by Pauli noise, I mean, uh, yeah, for, first of all, we can consider the effective Pauli group, mod out phases as, as we are used to. And then the Pauli channel is a channel of this type where WA is, is the, some, some Pauli operator associated to the effective Pauli group element A, okay? And then a Pauli channel is basically given as a super operator having on the diagonal a probability distribution P of, two, P of A. And I will focus on these types of probability distributions uh, in the rest of the talk. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to say what local noise is. It's basically a, the analog as with local Hamiltonians, where a local Hamiltonian is a sum of strictly local terms. And you, here we have something similar, that a local Pauli channel is a product of strictly lo local Pauli channels. So here I fix uh, uh, some, some set of regions, capital gamma, and then the regions are given by the small gammas here. And the lambda sub gamma are Pauli channels that are supported on, on that region, small gamma. I, I hope this, this makes sense to you. So it's the analog of a local Hamiltonian, basically, but, but with a product instead of with a sum and, and with Pauli channels instead of local Hamiltonian terms. So examples would be the capital gamma here, which basically tells us what, what our non-trivial supports are. For a single qubit Pauli noise, this would be the set of all the singletons. And for two qubit noise, this would be like all sets of pairs of qubits. Okay, you have to 
like this this like this page is important here okay this slide um, uh, and then we need to do some assumptions in order to be able to estimate the Pauli noise we cannot estimate our arbitrary Pauli noise but we need to use this locality and um, and we use it in the following way so first we say that a region small gamma is physically correctable if there is no undetectable error supported on that region I mean with with uh, uh, with trivial syndrome, an error, or a Pauli operator with trivial syndrome. And then we can make the same division, definition with logically correctable. Uh, so small gamma is logically correctable if every undetectable error is supported on gamma uh, is logically trivial, meaning that a stabilizer. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, okay, and now we can say when, uh, when such a local Pauli channel is uh, physically or logically correctable. And here we have to consider basically all possible uh, unions of, of, of pairwise supports. Yeah, so this, this is a technical definition, but we need this for, for the main theorems. Um, so so uh, the capital gamma is correctable if uh, all these regions are correctable. And then we have like the same story twice for physically and logically correctable. And we also, for issues that I mentioned before, we assume that or error rates are smaller than one half, or the, the weight on the identity is bigger than one half, which is not really a restriction here. Okay, uh, so this is basically the definition we need, but I want to relate this to the distance and the pure distance, which, which might be known to you. So say, say if for, for any region in the set of regions we are considering, uh, twice the size of that region is smaller than the pure distance, then it, the first point is fulfilled, then the channel is physically correctable, and when the same thing is fulfilled for the distance instead of the pure distance, then it's logically correctable. So remember, the distance is the smallest weight of a Pauli error on the logical subspace or a Pauli operator, and the pure distance is a bit similar, but here it's the weight of uh, the smallest undetectable Pauli operator or Pauli error. <clears throat> so essentially, it's the smallest uh, stabilizer of the code. Um, for, for, for this reason, it's the, uh, equal to four for the... Um, for the Tory code, for instance. Okay, so so basi basically, this is the definition. I hope this makes sense to you, and it's uh, I th we think that it's the most meaningful one. And given this definition, we can now make the following statement. <coughs> I can prove that a local Pauli channel, as on the previous slide, uh, can be estimated from the cinder measurements if and only if it is physically correctable. So it's basically the strongest statement you can hope for. Because if this is not satisfied, then one can, it's easy to show that then you cannot estimate the corresponding Pauli channel. And uh, then we have the analogous result in, a, in, a, in, a, in the next paper about the logical Pauli channel. So this can be estimated uh, from the syndrome measurements up to logical equivalence, um, if and only if the logical channel, uh, uh, only if, if and only if the noise is logically correct, or the, the noise channel is logically correctable. Um, as in the previous slide. Yeah, it's also, again, the strongest statement one can hope for. If this is not satisfied, then the statement would be wrong. And we are all, all, the, all the, yeah. Uh, and uh, I want to say that here it's just stated as an existence uh, statement, but, but it's constructive. The proof is constructive, and it also constructs a system of equations like, like in the example that we have seen before. <clears throat> And we can generalize these statements beyond uh, simple uh, stabilizer codes. <clears throat> the statements also hold for s subsystem codes and so-called data syndrome codes, if you're familiar with those. So one can generalize these statements. So in the last uh, yeah, six minutes, I would like to give you a proof overview and uh, how the whole thing works. So here's basically the, the full overview and how everything is connected. Let me walk you through it. So what we are given for, from from our quantum computer is the syndrome data. So what, what the data we have access to are the expectation values of all the stabilizers where like all, we assume for now for all, from all, for all elements in the stabilizer group. And what we want to know in the end are the Pauli error rates. Um, I will later show you that this, is, this corresponds to a convolution effector graph model. But, but under the assumptions, we want to get all the error rates of our, yeah, the underlying probability distribution of our a quantum channel uh, that describes the noise. And so now our contribution is to, to, to show uh, that, well, there's not much to show, but you can Fourier transform the Pauli error rates 
with a Boolean Fourier transform corresponding to the uh, abelian group, um, the effective Pauli group. And then we get the Fourier transformed quantities, which, which we call moments, because for stabilizer elements, they are actually the, exactly the expectation values. Um, and this model is, is not unique. So what we, we are doing is to Möbius transform it, or using the inclusion-exclusion transform, which is similar to, to, to the canonical form of factor graphs, if, if you're familiar with that. And then we get transformed moments, which we call canonical moments. And they are in one-to-one -one correspondence under the assumption of correctable noise to the, uh, to the data we have access to. Okay, and for, for this purpose, we have to solve a binomial system of equations similar as the one we have seen before for the Tori code. So that's the very high level overview. And in the last minutes, I want to like start the sketch on how this looks uh, in, in a bit more detail. And then at some point I have to skip to the end and you can ask me more afterwards. Oops. Um, so uh, here, here we are. Uh, we start with the, basically the symplectic inner product. We call it the bike character on, on the effective Pauli group, uh, which is given by that. And now when we have a function like the, the, the um, distribution of error rates on the effective Pauli group, then we can Fourier transform it in, in this way where the coefficients here are given by the symplectic inner product and we, yeah, it just looks like a regular Fourier transform and one can transform it back. And when there's a Fourier transform, there's also a convolution which map onto each other in the usual way. So here we have the, the convolution on the, on the Pauli group, which is given in this way. And then you have the usual identity that the Fourier transform of the convolution just translates into a product in the real numbers, so in the, in the range of the function. And um, now we can use the convolution to rewrite our, our uh, Pauli channel. I think this is a very, like, it's not very complicated when you write it out, but it's perhaps very useful also for other purposes. Like, given such a local Pauli channel, um, and we had the, the, we said we can identify Pauli channels with probability vectors, the, when the, curry, the, when the Pauli channels correspond to each other like that, then you get such an equation for the probability vectors. So basically the product here on the level of Pauli channels translates to a convolution on the level of uh, probability distributions. And uh, uh, that's also why the Fourier transform comes in, because we can remove the, the uh, convolution product here. And now there's one thing that is missing that at some point I said up to logical equivalence. So I meant that we can estimate the logical uh, a Pauli channel, which is basically given by a twirl of, of the, the physical noise, which is given by the distribution P, over the stabilizer group. And then we get the logical Pauli channel. And now the critical thing that I talked about, like uh, the, the moments, are, uh, are, are the Fourier transforms of, of, of the physical noise model. Because, for instance, when you put in a stabilizer operator, like when you feed this in into, this, in, into the definition of the Fourier transform, and now, now you consider a stabilizer operator, when you have no error, you have a one here. When you have an error, you have a minus one here. So when you plug in the, the probability distribution here, you get exactly the expectation value of the stabilizer operator. That's why we call it E, because it's really the expectation values for, for, uh, yeah, for, for when, when, when the, the A here is a stabilizer element. And the analogous thing we can do for the logical uh, noise channel. And now the problem is that this decomposition here is not unique. That's why the Möbius inversion that I mentioned before comes in. <clears throat> and for this reason, we switch over to canonical moments, uh, which are given, yeah, I, I don't want to go through the math here, but essentially what you have to do is to, when you have uh, error rates corresponding to a region, you have to make sure that the, the error actually touches the whole region at once. And it's not just, just a smaller error which you embed into a larger region. And this you can do basically by, by factoring out smaller errors in an iterative fashion, but somehow taking into account that you don't overcount. And this is done by this inclusion-exclusion principle or this Möbius inversion. Uh, which is it's super useful. And we need to, yeah. Then basically we get a set of poly strings which corresponds to, which is relevant uh, in this Möbius inversion analysis, which corresponds to our locality set by capital gamma that we, st we started with. And then we can, yeah, write down this Möbius inversion with, with a bit, bit more specialized form. Um, so, and now I can restate our estimation problem again. So what we are given are 
uh, the expectation values of the stabilizer operators. And what we want to know uh, is, is basically the, all, all the error rates, or equivalently all the expectation values of the errors uh, on, on our yeah, set of allowed supports here. Yeah? And, and uh, here you can see that that's a binomial system of equations. Like when we put in the stabilizers here on the left-hand side, then we have some product on the right-hand side. And we're given the left-hand side and want to know the terms on the right-hand side. So we need to invert this binomial system of equations. And uh, the main thing what, that we have to do is that, like the whole thing that the, yeah, can be inverted, but the, the critical thing happens here between the canonical moments and the, and the data, which is given by this system. And this can be done for, for the physical error rates. Basically, one can has, yeah, this binomial system of equations corresponds to a matrix D, which indicates which terms on the right appear. And then this matrix has to have full rank. And uh, this, this was really a piece of work to, to prove this. One has to write it out, like we did it by cal calculating this matrix. Then we used local, random proper, ran local randomness properties of codes, which are general statements. That's why we can make a general uh, statement in the end. And then there's a messy analysis with uh, iterated true complements, and then one can prove that this matrix has full rank. Um, there's an analogous thing about logical, the logical channel, but it's a bit easier, and we need what's called the cleaning lemma. Uh, I think I have to skip this. And uh, yeah, and have to, have to go to, to the conclusion, I think. Um, or maybe if there's one more minute, I want to say that it's constructive. <laughs> so, so I really showed you that the, the whole thing here is constructive. Everything can be calculated efficiently. Um, and this gives us, when you put this together, this gives off this type of algorithm, and we've run a, a preliminary analysis, like where we can plot the logical error rate against the distance for different calibrations of a decoder, like from either a, a calibration where we take the average error rate of the physical qubits, or we take perfect knowledge, then this gives you the best you can hope for, or we take an estimate from 10 to the 4 many stabilizer measurement rounds or measurement shots. Um, and this was done for the surface code with a tensor network decoder uh, by, <laughs> by Chris. And uh, yeah, we took noise that is similar to, to an actual hardware. OK, here's my conclusion. Um, so we showed we've proven identifiability of, of error rates in general uh, stabilizer quantum error correction and beyond, like also for subsystem codes and data syndrome codes. Um, I think there's very nice ma mathematics behind it with like this whole Boolean Fourier analysis machinery and the inclusion exclusion principle. And there's much more work to be done. Uh, like here's a list of some, some things. Maybe I outlined the circuit, circuit noise, which might be the most relevant one. <clears throat> but there's also more. And I think my time is up. And I would like to thank my co-authors uh, and you for your attention. And I also want to point out that I'm also hiring like everybody else here, I think. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Okay, any questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you said at the end that you might want to consider additional circuit noise. How do you think you would include something like uh, coherent noise into this, given this sort of very strong reliance on having a polystochastic channel. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that's possible. I th for, for our approach, we really need the noise channel to be, to be diagonal in the Pauli basis, and then you have Pauli noise. Um, I think you shouldn't be able to observe the off-diagonal elements of a noise channel f just from syndrome data. Then you need to... Yeah, to do something else. Like, like, uh, but that's, that's another thing. Maybe one can you do this in the framework of sub subsystem codes, that you make the code space a bit smaller and use the, the additional freedom that you have to estimate off the diagonal elements of the noise channel, but that's completely open. Uh, yeah, very good point. Yeah, related to that, I'd be interested to know as well, like there's this folk wisdom that if you have coherent noise and you're on a topological code and you grow it big enough that it effectively acts like a Pauli channel, at least on the logical part that it like approaches it. I'd be interested to know what, what happens if you just act as if it was a power channel and then try and... Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, so yeah. I would expect that we measure something like the projection of it. 
right. uh, onto the Pauli right. channel. So that's what I meant by model mismatch. Yeah. Like when, when you have a noise that does not fit our noise model, yeah. we expect that we estimate, some, or the estimate will be something cl at least close to the projection of your general channel to, right. to the model that we have. And it'd also be interesting if maybe you don't accurately model the errors, but maybe you can still correct well. Yeah, even if it's not accurate. Yeah. 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 When, you, when you can prove the estimate of the actual noise, then it can still yeah, yeah, help yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that makes yeah sense. right. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, actually, I have a quick one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious, have you tried the framework in this context of entanglement-assisted codes before? Uh, in entanglement-assisted codes, no. Uh, because I feel like it's a quite general, quite interesting extension from like stabilizer codes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so familiar with it. I cannot comment really, but maybe we can think about it briefly. No, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, no, uh, we, d we didn't. <laughs> uh, I think there are many ways one can move this forward. I, and I think it's also important because like when you really want to error correct in practice, then like every bit of, of uh, yeah, logical error rate that you can improve is, is worth it, I think. Uh, and here, the uh, the computation effort of the estimation is much much slower than the one of the decoding. Um, so we just need to plug in our yeah we calculate the binomial system of equations once and then we just plug in the data and have to evaluate them to get the estimate. So that's computationally cheap compared to the decoding. Okay. Any final questions? Thank you very much, Martin, for the nice talk. So, I mean, the idea is like you want to estimate noise rates while uh, running the computation, while correcting the errors, right? Yeah, that's the so typical. I, I, yeah. I asked right. you last time about that. Like, so typically, the, the mindset that experimentalists now have is like you have one series of experiments to, to estimate the errors and another for the computation, right? But do you really imagine, like in practice, that experimentally you would kind of like. So, so experimentally, how, how, in, other, in other words, like how do you expect this to be useful in practice in experiment? Like uh, you accumulate the stabilizer measurement data until you have enough data to get a reasonably good estimate of your center measurements. Uh, then you make the estimate and adjust the uh, decoder accordingly. Maybe that's not the best you can do. Maybe there are some Bayesian, there are Bayesian ideas to improve that. But as a first attempt, uh, this this would be practical. But I mean, so. I, I think the method is extremely interesting, don't get me wrong. But yeah. in practice, like, wouldn't then be easier to just, you know, do whatever method to estimate the errors uh, independently of, like, the actual measurements in the syndrome uh, detection? Like, like uh, I wouldn't know how, uh, like, due to the obstacles well, no, noise that noise character, Like, Pauli noise thing. characterization, like, yeah. Like. Oh, but this you need to do before you run your... Uh, your your quantum error correction. So yeah, probably you would do this in the beginning mm. to 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 do the traditional thing, mm. but then while you're decoding, you get this information anyway, so you can just mm. make use of it and right. and improve the estimate of right. of the noise. And yeah, cer certainly one can do this more optimally than just using our plain vanilla estimation. But uh, that's yeah, right. that's also cool. something we're working on. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.